Question 21, portfolio Y has an expected return of 10%, volatility of 25%, and a beta of 0.5%. The market has an expected return of 12% and volatility of 25. Assuming that the risk-free rate is 5%, what is Jensen's alpha for portfolio Y? This is gonna be pretty straightforward. We are given all the variables that we need to calculate this. Um, so let's just talk through Jensen's alpha. So Jensen's alpha is going to equal the return of the portfolio. And then we're essentially taking the return of the portfolio and then we're subtracting out what the expected return should have been under cap M. So this second part is just cap M. So we got risk-free rate plus the beta times um, equity risk premium. So that's market return minus risk-free rate. So when we plug in all these numbers, um, return of the portfolio is 10. We pull that from right here as our um, expected return. Um, and then uh, we have risk-free rate of 5%, so that's gonna be plugged in right here, and again here for equity risk premium. And then we've got our beta of 0.5 um, plugged in right here, and then um, the market expected return of 12%, which is right here. So when we do out all that math, essentially our alpha ends up being 1.5%. Uh, which is right here, answer D. Question 22, you've been given the following details for two bonds. So we've got a US Treasury bond and a corporate bond, principal and coupon for both of these. If the coupons are paid on March 5 and September 5 of each year for both bonds, what is the interest accrued on both bonds between the period of March 5, 2017 and May 27, 2017? Um, so we've got values here for the treasury bond and the corporate bond um, and they kind of We've got the same here for treasury bond and then it kind of varies down the line here um, So how are we going to calculate this? Uh, let me pull in the formula and the tricky part here is kind of in the difference in how they are calculated So for the treasury bond, we're going to be using the actual um, actual number of days convention here so the first part is going to be the same for both of these uh, bonds. So we're going to be doing 100 for principal multiplied by that coupon, and we're doing 2.5% for the treasury bonds since they're paid, um, coupons are paid twice a year. So we've got 2.5% for each coupon. And then we're multiplying that by um, the number of days in the, uh, that have accrued between March 5 and May 27, and then dividing that by the number of days between coupon payments. So the numerator is number of days between these two dates, and then the denominator is number of days between March 5 and September 5. Um, so when we do that out, we get 1.277, which rounds to $1.128 on the treasury bond, um, which we've got for A and B, so we could uh, rule out C and D here. Um, and then for the corporate bond, we're going to use 30, uh, 30 and 360 day convention. So for that, uh, what that ends up looking like is we get 100 times the 3% coupon, um, since that's our coupon, paid semi-annually. And then we're multiplying that by 82 divided by 180. Um, and that gives us 1.3667, which rounds there to 1.367, um, which corresponds right here to answer B. Question 23. Board independence is a fundamental is fundamental to effective corporate governance as it ensures objective oversight in decision making free of, from conflicts of interest. Um, identifying factors that may compromise this independence is crucial for maintaining the integrity and accountability of the board. Which of the following combinations is most likely to affect the independence of the board? So we've got A, chief executive officer as a member of the board of directors. Um, this is likely not going to affect the independence of the board. It's pretty common for the CEO to be one of the board members. Um, I think generally it's recommended that they're not the chairman of the board and the CEO. Um, B, chairman of the board as a member of the remuneration committee. This is certainly um, would be fine as well. The remuneration committee is going to be helping set compensation for um, senior management, not for the chairman of the board. Um, so there shouldn't be any conflict of interest there, um, which is key up here that we mentioned. Uh, C, C, chief executive officer as the chairman of the remuneration committee. Um, so this would likely lead to some issues. So I think we can probably pencil in C. 
Um, like we mentioned on B, the remuneration committee is going to be setting compensation for senior uh, management. So the CEO would basically be the uh, deciding their own compensation, uh, which would uh, certainly create a conflict of interest. D, chairman of the board as the chairman of the ethics committee. This could also be a good thing. Um, so I think we can rule that out and we'll stick with answer C. Question 24, the following are the data on the financial analysis of a sales company's income over the last 200 months. So we've got a bunch of uh, numbers, formulas here. Uh, what is the value of the skewness? So this is going to be um, a big long formula that we need to kind of remember related to skewness. Um, so essentially we're given all of these inputs up here. So the key is for this question was essentially memorizing this formula. Um, so this is the formula that we need to, to remember here. And we can see we're kind of given a lot of this stuff. So we've got one over N, we're given N at 200. Um, and then we can see that's plugged in right here. And then for the second part of this formula, um, we're given this right here um, as 774, uh, sorry, this one is um, the three. So we've got the three, that's the distinguisher there, um, which is given at minus a little 13,000 and some change. So that plugs in right down here. Um, and then in the denominator, we've got one divided by n minus one, so that 200 gets plugged in again there for n. And then this whole second factor that we're multiplying by is right here. So it ends up being that 774 or 759 number, and then that's raised to the three over two. And we get skewness of minus 0 .00274, um, which rounds uh, closest to answer A. Question 25, you've been provided the following set of values for an independent variable A and a dependent variable B. So we've got A, one, two, three, four, and then those corresponding values for B. What are the slope and the intercept of the regression line? So our slope, um, we're gonna need to, uh, a few different things here. So we're gonna need the covariance of A and B, and then we're gonna divide that by the variance of A, um, which is the independent variable. And so we're gonna need to go through and calculate a few different numbers for A and B there. And then the intercept of the regression line, um, we're gonna figure that out um, using that slope and then taking the average of A and B um, to uh, figure that out. So in order to get all those numbers, um, we're gonna start by calculating in this table. So the first thing we're gonna do for A and B is calculate the average. So our average of A is gonna be 2.5. Average of B will be 10. So A minus A bar um, going down uh, the rest of this chart is gonna be one minus our average of 2.5. So minus 1.5, one minus 2.5, and then kind of so on, so forth. And then same thing for B. So five minus the average of 10 would give us minus five. And then moving down the line here, covariance of A and B is gonna be these two values multiplied together. Um, and then kind of same thing down the line here. So we're doing these two are multiplied to get covariance of A and B. And then to get the overall covariance, we're gonna be adding all these values up. So we get 17 and then, um, so that's one variable for our slope that we need. And then the second variable we need for our slope is the variance of A, which is gonna be all these variables added up. And how we get to these is we do um, minus 1.5 and we square it to get 2.25 minus 0.5, we square it to get 0.25 and so on. And then these are added up to get that five. So that brings us to a slope of um, essentially these two numbers, 17 divided by five, so we get 3.4. Um, so we've got slope of 3.4, 2.6, 3.1 and 2.8. So essentially we can rule out all our answers at that point. So if we were in a hurry on the exam, you could kind of just go with A and move along. Um, let's go ahead and calculate the intercept since we have all the numbers already though. So like I mentioned at the beginning, to calculate the intercept, we're gonna need B bar, which is our um, average of B, and then we're gonna subtract that by the beta, uh, which is our slope coefficient. So 3.4 times uh, A bar, which is average of A. 
Um, so when we do that, we get 1.5, um, which corresponds right there with answer A still. Question 26, two investors, A and B, invest $1,000 each in two different financial instruments. Investor A receives a return of 5% with semi-annual compounding, while investor B receives a return of 5% with quarterly compounding. After two years, what will be the terminal values of the two investments? So we are going to be using our um, time value of money calculator right here. Um, and essentially we're just gonna be plugging these numbers in. So for semi-annual, we'll have N of four since we're receiving um, two coupons a year for two years. For quarterly, we'll be have eight. Um, for interest, we'll have 2.5 in semi-annual. Again, it's that 5% divided by two. And then for quarterly, we're gonna divide that 5% by four. We get 1.25, payment is zero. Um, since there's no coupon that we're actually receiving, we're just receiving that rate of return. And then PV of 1,000, then we'll solve for future value in both cases. So I'm gonna pull up the calculator and we'll plug these numbers in and um, see what we end up with. Um, so we'll plug in 1,000 for present value, payment of zero, uh, I'll do semi-annual first. So then we've got 2.5 for our interest on semi-annual and then four for N, so then we're gonna compute future value. So we get 1103.8129. Um, <clears throat> so that's gonna correspond with answer A. And we don't have that for any of the other answers. So if we were pressed for time, we could go ahead and just choose A and move along. But since we have time right now, let's go ahead and calculate um, investor B's return. So we can leave um, present value and payment the same. We just need to change the I and the N. So for I, we have 1.25. And then for N, we'll have eight. And then you just hit that compute again for future value. And we get 1104.486, which we can see also corresponds with answer A. Question 27, an asset that provides no income has a storage cost of USD three per unit paid at the end of the year. If the spot price of the asset is 20 uh, USD 220 and the risk-free rate is 5%, the futures price for the asset, assuming the expiry date is exactly one year from today, is closest to. So this is the formula we're gonna be using. Um, so we're gonna be looking for a futures price and that's gonna be equal to the current price of the asset, um, which will be 220 um, and then we will be adding storage cost uh, to that. Um, and then that's gonna be uh, multiplied out by the continuously compounded rate of 5%. And since we have T of one, um, that's this is just gonna be 0.05 up here. So the tricky part is we're given three, USD three for U, um, but we need to do one more step in here and discount that back to the present value. So if we just plugged in three for you, um, we would not get the right answer. So we need to discount that back using the continuous, continuously compounded variable. Um, so we get U is equal to that three, and then we're multiplying that by uh, minus 0.05, discounting back by the risk-free rate for one year. So we get 2.854. So then from here, we can just plug the 2.854 in for U, the 2.20 in for um, spot price, and then we will um, multiply that by the risk-free rate continuously compounded. And we can see that here, and it brings us to 234.28, um, which is right here. Answer D. Question 28. A trader wants to price a bond with a 5% coupon rate and a maturity of 1.5 years. The coupon payment is semi-annual. Due to a bug in the system, the trader was not able to download the complete structure of the market spot rates. The table below shows the data the trader was not able to gather. So we've got the spot rates at 0.5 years, one year, and 1.5 years, but we're missing this one here. Which of the following are the missing spot rate and the bond price if the one year discount factor is 0.9831? Um, so we'll be calculating the spot rate here and then the bond price from that. So let me pull in uh, what that formula is gonna look like. So our spot rate, is gonna be um, pretty straightforward. We don't need anything in this table um, to calculate that. Sorry, this is what we're calculating. Um, so we're gonna be using the one year discount factor to calculate. So we'll have one over that discount factor and we're gonna raise that to the 0.5, subtract out one, multiply by two, 
Um, and we're multiplying by two due to that semi-annual coupon payment. And that gives us a spot rate of 1.71. Um, so we've got one year spot 1.71, 2.1, 2.5, or 2.65. So it looks like A is gonna be our answer. Um, if we were pressed for time, we could go ahead and uh, click that and move on. But we will go ahead and calculate the bond price. So now that we have this spot rate, um, to calculate the bond price, we're just going to be discounting all these cash flows back to the present. So we've got 5% coupon, semi-annual. So our coupon is going to be 2.5, 2.5, and then 100 plus that 2.5. Um, and then we're going to be discounting that back at our spot rates at each of those. So we can see the spot rate for that first term at half year is going to be 1.1%, um, and then kind of so on and so forth and our T variable changes up here too. Um, so after we uh, work out that math, we get 102.967, which we can see also corresponds there in A, um, and it doesn't in B, C, or D. Um, so we can confidently go with answer A. Question 29, a zero coupon bond with a notional value of USD 100 and price X has the following probability density function. So we've got our uh, probability density function, um, x over 5,000 for uh, x between uh, 0 and 100. Determine the probability that the price of the bond is between 80 and 90 inclusively. So let's pull in what this is going to look like. Um, so the steps here, first thing we're going to do is set up the integral which is um, what we're looking at up here. So the probability that we're between 80 and 90. Um, so we've got x over 5,000, which we're taking right from, right from the function. And then um, our x is going to be 1. Um, and then from here, we're going from 80 to 90. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the antiderivative of x. Um, and when we take the antiderivative of x, that's going to be uh, x squared over 2, which is what this is right here. So x in this instance ends up being 90 um, divided by 90 squared over 2 and then subtracting 80 squared over 2. And then we're multiplying this whole thing out by 1 over 5,000. So that ends up giving us 1,700 over um, 10,000, which is 0.17 um, or 17%. Answer A. All right, question 30. If the covariance between Canada and American interest rates is 0 0.092, and the variances of interest rates in Canada and US are 12.32 and 11.04, respectively, then which of the following is closest to the correlation between Canada, sorry, Canadian and American interest rates? So to calculate correlation, it's going to be um, our covariance, and then we're going to divide that by the standard deviation of Canada and US. So the tricky part with this question is we're not given standard deviation. We're given the um, we're given the variances. So we're going to need to take the square root of those variances to get this, to get the standard deviations. Uh, but once we identified that, it's going to be pretty straightforward. So our covariance uh, plugged in right here in the numerator, and then standard deviation of a. We're just going to do 12.32 for Canada, or 0.1232 square root multiplied by 0.1104 square root. Um, and when we do that out, we get 0.7889, which is going to be right here. Answer A.